Good morning, all. The title of today's lecture is The Roman Way of Life and Death at Ostia, the Port of Rome. On Tuesday, we spoke about architecture under the Emperor Hadrian, the extraordinary Emperor Hadrian. Uh, we talked about the buildings that he commissioned, and some of which he also had a hand in designing, since, as we mentioned, he was an amateur architect himself. Uh, we spoke about that Greek import, uh, the Temple of Venus in Roma, and also about the two major commissions during his principate, the Pantheon in Rome and Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli. The main takeaway point vis-a-vis uh, -vis both of these buildings, and you see them once again now on the screen at left and right, uh, is that Hadrian followed the lead of Trajan before him. Uh, what Trajan had done and Apollodorus of Damascus had done in the Forum of Trajan and in the markets of Trajan, and that is to combine in one building complex uh, both the traditional and the innovative strands of Roman architecture. Uh, the traditional that goes back to Greek and Etruscan architecture and is marked by uh, the traditional elements, the traditional vocabulary of architecture, namely columns and walls and the roofs that they support, and then more innovative Roman architecture, which is predicated on concrete construction uh, faced with a variety of materials from stone uh, to what we'll see today is the ascendance of brick. Uh, as a facing which began, as you'll recall, after the fire uh, in A.D. 64 in Rome. Again, looking at these two buildings as examples of what Hadrian, uh, he and his architects uh, tried to do, uh, the Pantheon, you'll recall, on the left has a traditional porch, a porch that looks very much like a typical a Greek, Etruscan, or Roman temple, but then a, a revolutionary body. When you walk inside the building, a revolutionary uh, a cylindrical drum and hemispherical dome. And then with regard to the uh, t uh, Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli, I show you a view of the Canopus, and you'll recall that the Canopus makes use of columnar architecture. There are columns that border uh, one end of the pool. Uh, although they are columns with a twist because you can see they support a straight and an arcuated lintel, which we saw in second style Roman wall painting, in painting, uh, and then eventually it begins to infiltrate. Built architecture comes to the fore under Hadrian. So that's a playing around with those lintels in a way you wouldn't have seen in Greek and Etruscan architecture, but still relies in the main on the traditional vocabulary <laughs> of architecture. But then you'll recall on the other end of the pool uh, a building that was meant to conjure up the, uh, the Serapium in uh, the Temple of Serapis in uh, Canopus in Egypt, but that was made out of concrete construction uh, and that had a segmented dome, a kind of pumpkin dome that we believe that Hadrian designed himself. So this extraordinary combination of traditional and innovative Roman architecture that we see the hallmark of Hadrianic architecture. Uh, and a gift uh, that he gave uh, to the future evolution of architecture. The other major contribution of the Hadrianic period that Hadrian himself had less to do with because it was already bubbling up after the fire in AD 64 uh, is, this, is the move that we're going to see today toward multi-storied housing. We saw that begin already at the last gasp of Pompeii and Herculaneum. You'll remember after the earthquake of 62 and before the, uh, the eruption of Vesuvius, the Pompeians and the, those who lived in Herculaneum began to build, began to add additional stories to their residential <coughs> structures. Uh, usually, and that meant, for the most part, a second story being added to their residential structures. But they never went beyond that. What we see beginning to happen, uh, especially under Hadrian, uh, is the t a, a, an increased taste for multi-storied buildings, uh, multi-storied domiciles, but multi-storied residences uh, that had more than two stories, even up to as many as five stories, essentially apartment houses. And our best example for such apartment houses are in the city of Ostia, the port city of Rome, and it's therefore to the city of Ostia that we are going to turn to today. And in fact, we'll spend the entire lecture on the city of Ostia because like Pompeii and Herculaneum before it, 
uh, especially like Pompeii. Uh, we have uh, an extraordinary array of not only private domiciles, but also public architecture from the city of Ostia that gives us an outstanding sense of what this city looked like in antiquity. I show you a plan of Ostia in its heyday. You'll remember that the city was actually founded very early on. Uh, at the very beginning of the semester, we looked at the town plan of Ostia, which dated to the mid-4th century BC, around 350 BC. And you'll recall, and I'll remind you of this plan in a moment, uh, you'll recall that it was founded as, it was actually Rome's first colony, uh, although it was a colony in Italy, obviously, not, not outside the mainland, but a, its first colony in Italy, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, and uh, it was founded, as so many of these first colonies were, as a military camp. It was laid out as a costrum, as you'll recall. Uh, and that costrum, uh, one can see in the very center, I'm going to show you a better view of this from Ward Perkins in a moment, uh, but you can see that, that kernel uh, of the, uh, the costrum plan uh, right here in the center of this plan. But what this plan shows you is the way in which the city grew over time. Again, it began in the Republic. It continued to be developed during the Republic. It was under Augustus that some new buildings, some public buildings were added uh, to the locale, uh, including the theater. And we're going to look at the theater today. Uh, and then uh, ports were added, as you'll remember, and I'll review that momentarily. Ports were added at Portus uh, by Claudius and also by Trajan. And uh, it was after the port of Trajan that the city really began to take off in terms of its commercial activity. And much of the building uh, that we see in the city as, as it looks still today uh, belongs to the Hadrianic period and into the time of the successors of Hadrian, the so-called Antonine emperors, whom we'll also be, whose architecture we'll also be studying this semester. Uh, while this plan is on the screen, uh, let me just point out the location of Rome. Uh, the arrow points this way. The so-called Via Ostiense, the, the street that leads from Rome to Ostia, the Via Ostiense, and actually the city road becomes the uh, town, the, uh, the uh, country road, the country thoroughfare becomes the city street, the main city street, the uh, decumanus of the city of Ostia. Uh, you can also see in this, in this plan uh, the location of a place called Isola Sacra up there, uh, which we will see was the main cemetery for Ostia. Yes, there are tombs outside the city walls, uh, also elsewhere in the city, but our most best preserved tombs are from this area called Isola Sacra, and I'll show that to you also today. And here you can see the Tiber River, the Tevere, uh, the Tiber River wending its way from Rome uh, to Ostia. And it is, of course, along the Tiber that we'll see warehouses were located and where the ships uh, went back and forth to export or import uh, material, uh, uh, pro products uh, from Rome to Ostia and back again. We talked about, again, we talked about the building of ports at Ostia. We talked especially about the port that Claudius commissioned at Portus. Uh, and I remind you of it on the back of a Neronian coin, a coin of Nero, obverse with Nero's portrait, reverse representing that Claudian port. And we see it there. You'll remember it had curved breakwaters, which you can see in that coin depiction. Uh, and uh, a river god at the bottom, boats in the center, as well as the lighthouse. We see all of that on the coin. And you'll remember that the breakwaters were made up of columns that partook of that rusticated masonry that uh, Claudius so favored. Down here, a painting that I've shown you before that now is on, that is on the walls of the Vatican in Rome, the Vatican Museums in Rome, uh, where you can see Claudius's port this, uh, with its curved breakwaters and its lighthouse over here. Uh, and then the port that was added by Trajan during his reign, a multi-sided uh, additional port right here. And it was, again, the construction of that particular port uh, that really brought commerce even more. I mean, it had been used, this area had been used since the mid fourth century BC, but it begins to really take off. There's a real efflorescence uh, during this period. And uh, it is therefore not surprising that with commerce booming, uh, there was more need for residential, residential architecture for those who lived there, for the traders and 
so on and so forth, who live there. Uh, and we see this, um, this uh, the, the, the building of not only civic buildings, but especially of private domiciles uh, begins to move very rapidly apace. Uh, the city becomes more crowded, and there becomes this need to build up vertically uh, as well as horizontally. And we'll see that development today. Uh, tourists who go to Rome really miss the boat by not going out to Ostia in, more, in larger numbers because uh, most tourists don't tend to take the trip out to Ostia, but it's well worth it and it's very easy to get to. It only takes about 25 minutes to a half an hour on a suburban train uh, to get from Rome to Ostia. So uh, it's, it's a not to be missed uh, experience. And I show you one of these trains in the upper left that takes you very easily uh, from Rome to the site of Ostia. Uh, there are a number of stations in Ostia. One of them is Ostia Centro, the downtown of Ostia, which you see in that view in the upper left. And the other is Lido di Ostia, which means the beach. And I show you a view of Lido di Ostia down here. Now looking at that nice view of the ocean. I know we've all been, you're back from spring break, but still it's, it's, it's nice to reminisce about what some of you may have been doing uh, during spring break and see this wonderful view of the sea. And it looks very enticing, but I can tell you that it's not once you get there. I mean, it's very polluted. This is not one of the great beaches of the world. Uh, so don't be, don't be seduced uh, by Lido di, di Ostia. Stay on the train uh, and make your way to the site called Scavi di Ostia, which is the excavations of Ostia, the archaeological excavations, where you can see, as you saw, as one sees in Pompeii, an ancient Roman city, extremely well preserved. Uh, and you see uh, a, gl a glimpse of it over here, and you can tell even just from this glimpse uh, that we are dealing here with a city that is not unlike Pompeii. It has streets and sidewalks, and it has buildings along the side of either of those. But there is one main difference between this and what we saw at Pompeii, and you can see it very well in this image, and that is that these, build, these, these houses uh, that are along the street look different than those did in Pompeii, in that they are made out of concrete faced with brick, a very different kind of appearance. Uh, and one that is quintessentially Ostian uh, and makes this city well worth, well worth a visit. In fact, if we think of Pompeii as the quintessential first century AD Roman city, we should think of the city of Ostia as the quintessential second century AD city, the best example that we have of what a second century, a Hadrianic and Antonine city would have looked like, and that is what makes it so important to us. Here I remind you again of the original plan that we looked at, the plan from the mid-4th century BC, 350 BC, from Ward Perkins, that shows you the original costrum of the first colony. Uh, this rectangular space, very regular, with its own wall uh, surrounding the city, with the uh, Cardo, the north-south street, and the Decumanus, the east-west street, intersecting exactly at the center of that city. And then uh, at that intersection, as was Roman practice, the placement of the forum of the city, a great open rectangular space with a temple pushed up against the back wall, in this case, a temple of Jupiter, a Capitolium, uh, dominating the space in front of it, and then other buildings around it, as you can see. Although there's a striking difference between this forum and the forum that we saw at Pompeii, because you'll remember at Pompeii, the various uh, major buildings, the Basilica, the Temple of Apollo, and so on, uh, uh, sort of uh, radiating out from the central core of the forum. Uh, we don't see that here. We see the buildings uh, sort of placed separately uh, from that main forum space. But in every other respect, very similar to the general plan of these early Roman cities. What's also useful about this particular plan is the fact that it shows you the way, though, as time went by and as the city grew, it shows you the way in which the Cardo and the Decumanus were extended, and then the other buildings of the city were added uh, here and there, a number of baths, lots of uh, private residences. Uh, this is a particularly important building here at 15 and 16, which we'll look at today. The uh, 15 is the theater, and 16 is the so-called uh, Piazza of the Corporations, the Piazzale Daily Corporazioni, uh, which is very significant, uh, and we'll look at that uh, soon. If you go and visit the city of Ostia today uh, and enter at the uh, ticket booth, uh, what you see 
almost immediately is again a polygonal uh, masonry uh, street very, looking very much like Pompeii but once again there are no stepping stones in Ostia unlike Pompeii which is which uh, the plot thickens there in terms of why we see those in Pompeii and don't seem to see them anywhere else you walk along that polygonal masonry street pavement uh, and you see both the remains up here in the upper left of the original Republican city wall uh, and it should bring back memories of Opus Quadratum or Ashlar Masonry that we saw at the beginning of the semester. You can see it's consistent with the age in which it was built in the Republic. Uh, but then over here as you make your way along one of the, on the, one of the main streets uh, you see what is characteristic of Ostia as a whole, and that is concrete construction, brick-faced concrete construction, both for the residences and also for the public buildings and also for the religious structures, namely the temples uh, in this city. Uh, the reason for this, of course, takes us back to the Neronian period, the fact the great fire of 64, uh, when it was realized, you'll remember the Sabora, uh, which was located back beyond the precinct walls of the Forum of Augustus, the area where the working poor of Rome lived primarily in rickety uh, apartment houses that were made out of wood, multi-storied houses, those were actually multi-storied, but they were always going up in flames, and there was a recognition after the great destruction of the fire of 64 that the Romans needed to fireproof their buildings, and so they began, they recognized the fact that brick uh, is better at, at protecting the structure from fire than stone is, uh, and they ca stone can burn, uh, and they actually began to, as we know, we talked about this before, they began to build uh, their houses and many of their civic structures out of concrete faced uh, with brick. Uh, and we see that development especially well here in Ostia. And Ostia is extremely important for us also because many of, many comparable buildings that were put up in the city of Rome itself no longer survive. The same apartment houses that we're going to see at Ostia did exist in Rome. We have some remains of them. There's a very prominent one at the base of the Capitoline Hill to the left of the hill as you, as you uh, climb up that hill. But we have very little evidence for this in Rome, and so we have to rely on Ostia to give us the best picture of apartment building in Rome, in Roman architecture in the second century AD. Here is a, a spectacular view of Ostia as it looks today <coughs> from the air. And we are obviously looking down on the forum, on the great open rectangular space of the forum with columns uh, around it. We are looking also at the Capitolium, at the Temple of Jupiter, which is a very large structure, as you can see here, made out of concrete, faced with brick. It is a typical Roman temple, unlike Hadrian's Temple of Venus in Roma. Uh, because we can see that it has a facade orientation, it has a single staircase, it has a deep porch, freestanding columns in that porch, so a typical Roman uh, structure uh, and uh, it's typical Roman temple. And then you can also see its vast scale. There are a couple of people standing here who look minuscule in relationship to this building and uh, only part of the building, in fact, full height of the building is not even preserved here, so it was even larger still than what you see. Uh, the reason for its size is twofold. One, because we have already seen that this, uh, this taste for larger and larger buildings has really taken off. Uh, we saw it in Hadrian's Forum in Rome. We saw it in Domitian's Palace on the Palatine Hill. We saw it in Hadrian's <coughs> Villa at Tivoli and in the Pantheon, the largest span, the largest dome uh, ever built. So this taste for for largeness, grandiosity in architecture has really taken off. So it's not surprising uh, to see this Capitolium, which was built in the Hadrianic period, specifically 120 AD, also being large in scale. But there's a second and perhaps even more important reason, and that is in a city in which all of the most of the houses are what are called insulae, I-N-S-U-L-A in the singular, A-E in the plural, insulae. Uh, multi-storied apartment buildings, often of as many as five stories. If you want your Capitolium to stand out in that city and be seen up above those apartment houses, you've got to build it very high. Uh, and that is undoubtedly the reason that they, or one of the two reasons, the more important reason, that they have built this temple so large and especially so tall, so that you could see the Temple of Jupiter from everywhere uh, in the city of Ostia. 
Here's a view of the temple as it looks today in isolation. Again, only part of its height preserved, uh, but enough for us to get a very good sense of its concrete construction, brick facing here, uh, and as I've already described, the single staircase, the columns uh, in the porch, and so on. I mentioned already that it was under Augustus that uh, a theater and an entertainment district was added to the city of Ostia. And uh, it, it, that building, you see the remains of it here uh, along one of the major streets of the city of Ostia. It was uh, uh, renovated in around 200 AD, that is in the early part of the third century AD, so considerably later. It was uh, expanded to be able to hold 2,500 spectators at that particular point. And uh, much of the concrete and brick-faced construction belongs to that renovation. One can't imagine a building quite like this in the age of Augustus. So what you're seeing here uh, is pr primarily the restored uh, view, uh, the restored version of this building. But what you can see that does uh, at least link it back to the Augustan period is the fact that the design of the facade is very similar to the design of the theater of Marcellus in Rome uh, with, the with the arches and the, in this case, pilasters between them. That same general scheme that we saw for theater and for amphitheater architecture used here. The main difference, of course, is the fact that we have concrete construction with brick facing uh, rather than concrete <coughs> construction with stone uh, facing travertine in the case of the theater of Marcellus. I haven't yet shown you a Roman latrine, but th today is the day for the Roman latrine. Uh, we, and, but you have to imagine, of course, that in any major public building like a theater where you're going to have a lot of people uh, there at the same time, you have to provide a public latrine. And when I say a public latrine, <laughs> I really mean a public latrine. There was no privacy, as you can see, in this <laughs> latrine uh, whatsoever. Uh, what, it, what, it is, what it is composed of, as you can see, is a bench that lines the walls uh, with a series of holes in it and then just one single drain uh, that encircles uh, the building. So this gives you an idea of where you had to go if you needed to go uh, during intermission if you were attending uh, the, theater, uh, the theater in Ostia. One of the most important buildings at Ostia is, is uh, connected to this theater. Uh, I'm showing you now the plan of the theater, which corresponds uh, to theaters that we've looked at throughout the semester of typical Roman plan. It has a semicircular orchestra. It has a stage building, or scenae frons, here. Uh, it has a semicircular cavea, the, the seats which are um, the, uh, which are which are placed on top of, of course, in this case, a concrete uh, foundation. Uh, this, like other Roman um, Roman theaters, is an urban phenomenon. Uh, there was no hill to build this on, so the Romans had to build the Ostians had to build their own hill out of concrete and then support the cavea on top of that. But the cavea is made of stone seats. They use stone for the seats, as is traditional in Roman theater architecture. Uh, and then, uh, but we see that this theater is appended to a porticus. Now we've seen a porticus with these, uh, with these theaters before. It was in fact characteristic of theater design. And if you think back to the theater in Pompeii, for example, you'll remember that that porticus, which had uh, little, little uh, uh, shops all around it, or small cubicles all around it, uh, was used as a place where you could go during intermission to uh, relax, to walk around, to buy a playbill, uh, to pick up a souvenir t-shirt or whatever the, the equivalent was in those days, uh, a, a souvenir of your experience that evening at the theater. Uh, and so we see that same general scheme here, this whole idea of this open rectangular space uh, with some columns uh, and then with these little cubicles all along. But in this case, uh, it was not meant uh, to be a place for souvenirs or a place to store props. But instead, what we see is something quite fascinating given the, given the fact that the city of Ostia was primarily a commercial city, a place where uh, items were, were exported and imported uh, because it was a major port or harbor city. 
What this was used for instead, uh, hence its name, the Piazzale Daily Corporazioni, is a, a series of um, businesses that were spent, you know, the import export business essentially uh, is what these spaces were used for. Uh, and I'll show you, they're actually, some of them are quite well preserved, and I can show you indeed what they look like. Then in the center, something we also don't see in the Pompeii Theater, a small temple in the center, uh, a temple that corresponds to uh, Roman temples that we've looked at thus far. It's rectangular shape, uh, it's flat side and back walls, uh, it's some columns in the deep porch, a single staircase, facade emphasis as you can see here, relatively small in scale as these kinds of things go. And it has been speculated by the main excavator of this site that uh, it was used as a, uh, it, that it was dedicated to some god whose name we don't know. We don't know which god or goddess this was dedicated to. But the excavator has s speculated that it was probably some god uh, that had something to do with commerce and the blessing of commerce and that probably some trade guild, one of the trade guilds uh, that had its businesses set up here may have been the commissioners, may have paid for, indeed commissioned, uh, this particular temple. And I think that's a, you know, as good a theory as any and may well uh, be the case. This is a view. We're standing at the top of the cavea, looking down over that cavea. We can see the cunei or wedge-shaped sections of, of seats. Uh, we can see the stone, a stone that has been used uh, for those seats. We can see the semicircular orchestra, the scalloped, uh, the scalloped face of the uh, of the or of the stage, uh, and then one can imagine the Scanae fronds with its forest of columns behind. That part is not well preserved, uh, and there also would have been. I'll show you a restored view a, a little bit later, where you'll see that there was a much higher wall in between this and the piazzale that lay beyond. The wall is no longer there, so we can see very well through these columns the small temple that was debt put up by that trade guild uh, to some god of commerce. And then we can also see these cubicles all along the way that were used uh, as these import and export uh, emporia. This is a view of the temple as it looks today. We can see that single staircase, fairly narrow staircase here, the facade orientation, a couple of the columns, including a Corinthian a column that are still preserved uh, from that small structure. And then here a very useful view showing us again uh, these, these interesting spaces, rectangular spaces along here, uh, fronted in each case by columns. We'll see that those columns are made out of cement faced with brick, so shades of the sanctuary of Hercules at Tivoli. We haven't seen this before, uh, I mean, since then, uh, and that was a very unusual use. Here we're seeing something that actually becomes more common in the second century, uh, making concrete columns and then facing them with brick. I'd like to show you a few views of these, uh, of these, uh, of these import-export businesses, as I've called them. Uh, one of them here, uh, where we can see that the architecture itself, the walls and the columns, are only partially preserved. Uh, you have to imagine that in antiquity they went up higher than this. Uh, but what is well preserved are the mosaics on the floor uh, of each of these, well, or many of these, uh, spaces. Uh, and you can see they're all done in black and white mosaic, just the two colors. Uh, you can see the interest that the Ostians had uh, in geometric shapes. Uh, they uh, have inside these very abstract, inside the shop here, these abstract patterns, uh, although they they've made an attempt to vary them. Uh, but then in the front, uh, something very interesting that we see throughout uh, is the use of sea imagery because, again, they were in the import and export business. They were busy uh, you know, sending ships uh, back and forth from Italy to other parts of the Roman world by sea. Uh, and so it's almost all sea imagery. Here we see two heraldic dolphins. Dolphins are particularly popular in these scenes uh, facing one another as a kind of advertisement or shop sign uh, for this particular enterprise. Here's another one uh, where you can see, I like this dolphin in particular, he's nicely preserved and he has a wonderful serpentine tail uh, with a lot of flourish at the end here, as you can see. Uh, and then inside, a, an image of a boat, you can see it, it's partially preserved. What's wonderful about this example is it shows us 
that although these are fairly simple in design and are meant essentially as advertisements for the shop, uh, the artist and the patron have taken real care to think about what you're going to see when you're standing where, so that they have oriented these so that when you're facing the shop and deciding whether you're going to pick this one, there's 61 of these, by the way, around the perimeter of this structure, so you had a lot of choice uh, in terms of which enterprise you were going to, uh, you know, you where you were going to go to if you wanted to ship something uh, from Ostia somewhere else or receive a delivery. You had a lot of choices, although I don't doubt some of them specialize in different parts of the world, you know, in shipping to Egypt or shipping to Asia Minor. Uh, but you can see here uh, the dolphin, when you're standing deciding whether you want to go in, the dolphin, you face the dolphin. Once you're inside uh, and standing and talking to the owner, if you, if you turn around and look back, uh, you're going to see the, sh the, the boat head on. Uh, so they've really, they've orchestrated this in such, they've paid real attention. It's not done willy-nilly. They've paid attention uh, to what you're going to see where. Uh, when you are entering and inside uh, these spaces. Here's another one, not only dolphins, 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 you know, more dolphins and more dolphins, uh, but you also see in this case a lighthouse, which could either be a representation of their local lighthouse or some lighthouse uh, somewhere else uh, that this particular place ships to. And then the last one, which is the one on your monument list uh, with two boats. Uh, so again, how does one ship things from uh, Ostia elsewhere by boat? And so they tend to represent boats. So you've, see, you've kind of seen it all. Dolphins, boats, and lighthouses uh, tend to be uh, the items that are chosen uh, for these so-called advertisements. But this one is very useful, too, because you can see the, uh, the shapes and the colors of the tesserae that are used here. And although these are very effective, you can see that this is not the Alexander mosaic. Uh, these are not done with that kind of skill. Uh, they, they use only black and white, the simplest possible scheme, no colors. Uh, and you don't get the sense as you do with something like the Alexander mosaic. When you step back from it, it could almost be a painting. It's done that well with the cast shadows and the, and the crumpling uh, figures so well presented. Uh, here it's something quite different, more abstract, uh, and the stones are not as fine. You can see they haven't paid as much attention to getting them perfectly shaped. Uh, but nonetheless, it's very effective, uh, and it really does, it does what it intended to do. One of the sad things, I mean, it's great to see, and if you go out to Ostia, make a special point of seeing these and taking pictures, because I've been looking at these for many years, and uh, every time I'm there, it seems that there are fewer tesserae there. than the, These are the originals. Uh, there are fewer tesserae than there were before. I'm not saying that people take them, although I think people do take them, uh, but, but just that over time, by, by, by tourists walking on them extensively, they get, um, they got, they get loose. Uh, and they get spread around the site, and they haven't done as good a job as I think they should have, at, as they should at Ostia, in keeping these uh, mosaics together. Here's a restored view of the whole complex, where I think you can see that although the theater and the piazzale are connected to one another and are part of the same scheme and are a development, a further development and evolution uh, that is particularly appropriate for this commercial city of Ostia that comes out of the orbit of that earlier uh, uh, theater and porticus complex at Pompeii. We can see that although they're part of that same complex, they are distinct from one another. Uh, if you look at the theater and the cavea up above with the original wall of the Scanae Franz Preserve, we're looking at it from the back, uh, you can see that that was very high. Uh, so only if you were way up at the top of the cavea would you really get a sense of what lay beyond, and that once you got into the Piazzale over here with its temple uh, and with its various shops, uh, you were in another world, a commercial world. Uh, also interesting is the fact that although they're open to the sky today, in antiquity there was a covered colonnade, as you can see here, that would have covered uh, those shops. Uh, and you would have had to go in between the columns and back along the passageway in order to check out uh, what the options were. The city of Ostia, uh, like all Roman cities that we've talked about, Rome, Pompeii, Herculaneum, so on, all obviously had uh, a selection of bath establishments. Uh, Ostia was no exception. There are a number of baths preserved from the Roman city of Ostia. Uh, this being one of them, the so-called Baths of Neptune, that dates to 139 A.D. 
the baths of Neptune, so called because of a spectacular mosaic, black and white mosaic of Neptune uh, on, the, on the floor. I'll show it to you in a moment, but go into it in more detail a bit later in the lecture. If we look at the plan of the baths of Neptune in Ostia, I wondered if any of you can tell me whether uh, this is a plan that corresponds to the earlier bath buildings at Pompeii, the Stabian baths or the Forum baths, or conforms more closely to the imperial bath type that we saw in Rome from the time of Titus, let's say the baths of Titus and Trajan. Any thoughts? Brooks, you grimaced, but maybe I'll ask you. Do you have a pick on you? The earlier one, absolutely. And why? Why do you say that? Excellent, excellent. That's exactly right. We see the palestra on one side with the natatio or the piscina that was usually usually accompanied it over here, and then on the other side, all aligned in a row, uh, the typical bath, the bathing block. Uh, including the apoditerium, the, uh, cal the caldarium, the, tepidari the tepidarium, the caldarium, uh, and the frigidarium, although the frigidarium is not a round, alcoved uh, structure at all, so in that sense, perhaps influenced by some of what came in between uh, those early baths at Pompeii and the imperial baths in Rome. But it, it, and, and of course, also uh, note here the shops that line the front of it, which is also characteristic of the Stabian baths and the Forum baths at Pompeii. Uh, so they could have chosen the other, but obviously felt uh, that this was much more appropriate uh, to this uh, commercial town to use the smaller, more intimate bath type uh, here uh, than the imperial baths that had been developed in Rome from uh, the first century A.D. on. Uh, just a glimpse of the black and white mosaic that gives this bath its name, uh, the Baths of Neptune. You see Neptune here, uh, but you can also see the way in which every room in the bath, uh, which was made out of concrete faced with brick, as you can also tell from this view, uh, every room was covered with these black and white mosaics. Ostia is the land of the black and white mosaic. I'll return to that in a moment. Perhaps most importantly of anything that I show you today are the apartment houses of Ostia, and it's to those that I'd like now to turn. Uh, what you're looking at on the screen is a model of what one of these apartment houses would have looked like. This one is the so-called insula, I-N-S-U-L-A, of Serapis, the insula of Serapis, uh, and we're looking at it in a model that is in that museum of castes that I've referred to a number of times this semester at a place, at a part of Rome called Aor, E-U-R, uh, that, uh, that area that was built up in the fascist period by Mussolini in the 1930s. It's, it, this model is in that museum, uh, and it gives us as good an idea as anything I could show you of what one of these apartment houses looked like in its heyday, in the time of Hadrian. The word insula, I should mention, uh, it can be used in two ways. An insula either refers to an apartment, a multi-storied apartment house, or it refers to a block of houses in a city like Ostia. It's used, for whatever reason, it, it, it was used interchangeably to refer to either a block or to an individual house. Uh, so pay attention to that when you read about an insula or insulae. Again, this one uh, dates to the second century A.D., the, uh, the uh, insula of Serapis, and it, it basically was like a, a modern condominium, uh, and often more than one of these insulae were, next, were, were clearly next to one another, but more than one sometimes shared a common bath. So they would sometimes build a, bathing bil a, a bath building uh, that would be used by those who lived in those two apartment houses. Now, what's characteristic of this, especially as we think about it, think about it in relationship to early <coughs> domus architecture that we saw at Pompeii, those single-family dwellings, is the need in this teeming commercial city uh, to accommodate a very large uh, population and a small amount of space, uh, people on the whole who could not afford single-family dwellings, uh, who needed to be housed in these apartment buildings. They build up vertically. Uh, and as you can see, they go up to as many as five stories. And we see that the insula of Serapis was indeed a five-storied structure. It is made out of concrete. 
It is faced with brick. Uh, and what is particularly interesting about the brick facing here, and this is going to be our first example of this at Ostia, is the fact that at some point the Romans realized that brick was really attractive in its own right. Uh, and that didn't need to be stuccoed over anymore. If you think back to the Domus Aurea, even in the Domus Aurea, the uh, building was made out of, the palace was made out of concrete faced with brick, but the facade was gilded. And inside, you'll remember, Fabulous was commissioned to cover the entire, uh, the entire interior of the structure with stucco and then paint it. So you would have had no sense uh, when you were standing in the palace of Nero in Nero's day that it, w that it was a brick-faced concrete structure. Uh, but somewhere along the way, and it comes to the fore in the second century AD, they realize, hey, this brick is actually pretty attractive in its own right. Uh, it has texture. Uh, we can vary the color. We can use a reddish brick. We can use a slightly yellowish brick. Uh, we can add some stucco to make some decorative effects. This looks awesome. Uh, and we think, uh, we, you know, we, we, some, some uh, uh, in innovative architects got the idea, and innovative designers, to let's leave it, let's not stucco it over, let's let, let it speak for itself. Uh, and that was a very wise decision because, as you'll see today, these, the buildings that we have remaining from Ostia that were unadulterated bl brick exteriors without stucco are absolutely magnificent. Uh, and, and, they, and they became, the, art, the designers became real experts at rendering it in, in an extraordinary way. I think you can get a sense of that even in this model. So expose, expose brickwork here. Uh, you see these arches uh, made of bricks that are uh, kind of wedge-shaped and, and um, look like the sort of thing we saw earlier in stone, those wedge-shaped uh, sections of stone that we saw, for example, in the Filari Novi uh, gate. We see that sort of thing here. It may have been used just as it was in the Pantheon. You'll remember how they used them during the building uh, process to keep the uh, concrete from settling uh, before it dried. Uh, but they realized afterwards that these could be positioned in a, in a way that made them very attractive in their own right, ultimately. Uh, we can also see that they have added moldings, uh, usually with stucco, added moldings uh, that, have, that make uh, the building more attractive, sometimes even little pediments, as you can see over some of the windows over here. Uh, so they come up with strategies uh, to make this brick look even more attractive than it was on its own. Note also the shops in the first story. Uh, some of these are shops, some of these are actually staircases that lead you to the uppermost stories. And once again, uh, it's clear that the Romans have become so adept at using, using concrete that they are able to open up these walls. The, the openings are larger than they had been even before, uh, and so they're, they're, they become very good at, 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 at dematerializing the wall uh, in a way that um, becomes increasingly sophisticated over time. The most uh, famous house at Ostia is in a sense mine because it's called the Casa di Diana, the House of Diana, uh, at Ostia. And uh, we see a view of it here as it looks today. It was a multi-storied apartment building, a multi-storied insula. Only two of those stories are preserved now. I'll show you a restored view of what the original looked like momentarily. Uh, but we see it here as it looks today, concrete uh, faced with brick, Exposed brick, brick enjoyed uh, in its own right. Very large openings that lead into their either entranceways into the structure, uh, or, uh, or or lead to stair to um, staircases, or open up onto shops. Uh, we can see here in actuality the same sort of thing we saw in the model from Aor, and that is the use not only of exposed brick, but also of moldings uh, that are added either in brick sometimes or also sometimes in stucco of the nice uh, overhangs that they have created above the second story windows up there. We also see a lot of Italian school children, the, the Ostia and, pa and Pompeii also, but particularly Ostia because of their, its proximity to Rome and all the schools that they have in the city of Rome. Lots of kids uh, always out in groups and they, they always wear, they always seem to have t-shirts of the same color. So you'll see one red school and one yellow school and one blue school. It's a lot of fun. And every one of them has their, it's so funny to me, they, they have their cell phones and they're all clicking, clicking, clicking as they walk through these buildings. I'm not sure they're looking at anything, but they're definitely clicking. Uh, to record the fact that they were at Ostia. Perhaps that's for student papers, I don't know. 
But here a detail of the uh, insula of Diana looking through one of these entrance ways into the rest of the structure. And I'll bet you're as struck as I am in looking at this that with regard to vista, the interest in panorama and vista, it doesn't matter whether you're building out of rubble or stone or opus incertum or concrete or faced with brick. Uh, there, there is that aesthetic, that Roman aesthetic of of building things in such a way that wherever you're standing in that structure, you're going to be looking uh, from one part of the building to another, and you're going to be struck uh, by the wonderful scenes that you see uh, from, uh, you know, within and from within that building and from that building outside uh, of that structure. Here's the restored view of the Insula of Diana. Uh, where you can see that originally it was a four-storied structure. It's a cutaway in an axonometric view, four-storied structure. And this particular, uh, view, this particular restored view is also extremely helpful because it shows us that these houses did not have uh, the peristyle courts or the hortus uh, that we know from the Domus Italica or the Hellenized Domus. There was no space for that uh, in this commercial city. Uh, there is no emphasis on the greenery and the, and the wonderful uh, fountains and, and statuary that we saw in Pompeii. And keep in mind, of course, that Pompeii in Campania was essentially a resort <laughs> town, a very different kind of feel than Ostia, this teeming commercial center. So what they replace those with here in order to get more light into the structure uh, is a kind of a light well. And you see that light well up here. Uh, where there are also windows on multiple stories. And in fact, I would imagine uh, that those were the choicest uh, apartments to have uh, because they would have been less noisy uh, than what you can imagine an uh, apartment along the street must have been uh, with all the activity going in and out of the Thermopolia and uh, the other shops down below, um, and the cart traffic and so on. So again, I imagine the Lightwell apartment would have been highly desirable. Speaking of Thermopolia, we have them at Ostia as we have them at Pompeii, quite a number of them. Uh, and I show you the best preserved, which happens to be in Diana's house. Uh, and I show it to you here, the Thermopolium of the Casa di Diana at uh, Ostia. Uh, you can see that right uh, at the entranceway, they have put a black and white mosaic. You see inside uh, just what we saw at, uh, just at exactly the same thing that we saw at Pompeii, one of these counters that would have had recesses in it. Uh, so you have to imagine just the same as we saw there, a kind of fast food emporium where you would take a peek at what, was, uh, what looked good for the day, uh, make your choice. If you go inside the Thermopolium of Diana, uh, you see hanging on the wall a painting uh, which it seems likely may have served as a kind of shop sign. It might have been uh, hung outside the building to advertise what you could get in this particular thermopolium. And if we look at what's depicted here, uh, it's a still life of objects. And we see what seems to be a pomegranate on the right hanging on a nail on the wall. In the center, I don't know if you can see it from where you sit, but in the center, a block that supports a uh, what looks like a drinking cup that has little round things floating in it, lentils or chickpeas or something like that. Uh, and then at the far left, there's a plate that also is on a block, a plate that has a carrot and some other vegetables. So this may have been a vegetarian, I guess this was a vegetarian uh, restaurant uh, in Pompeii, one of, the, one of the healthier places one could go if one wanted a snack uh, in, uh, in, in, in Ostia, excuse me. Uh, for a very long, if, if, if you go to Ostia, by the way, you really do want to set aside a day to do that because by the time you take the half an hour ride out there, uh, get there, there's a lot to see. Uh, and it used to be if you'd go there for a day, which I'd done many, many times, uh, there was absolutely nowhere to eat. So you had to remember to bring your, and nowhere to get a, a bottle of water. So you'd have to remember to bring your bottle of water and maybe a snack. Uh, but they have rectified that in, most, in recent years, the last few years. They finally put up the Cafe Teria Daily Scavi, which loosely translated is the, the uh, excavation cafe, uh, the cafeteria of the excavations at Ostia. And it's actually a wonderful place. I have to say it's very modern. It has um, a wonderful deck with uh, tables and the ubiquitous Italian white umbrella. Uh, where one and the food is actually, you know, for a cafeteria, ain't bad. Pi Italian pasta is always hard to make bad, it's always good. Uh, and then inside, I thought you'd be amused to see when they decided on the decor for the interior of the cafeteria uh, with, its, with its simple tables and chairs, uh, they put brick on the 
wall, uh, and they then hung up these wonderful versions uh, of the uh, of the Piazzale Daily Corporazione, a black and white mosaic. So again, very attuned. Italians are really. I mean, they do build Ferraris, after all. They are very good uh, at, uh, at design and aesthetic and pay a great deal of attention to that and consequently always make one's surroundings pleasant. Warehouses. Uh, this, was a, this was a commercial port. We talked about the fact that in commercial ports, one needs warehouses. We talked, we, we began the semester with a warehouse. In fact, the Porticus Emilia uh, in Rome along the banks of the Tiber. Uh, and I remind you of that here. Here's the Tiber, a model of the Tiber with the Porticus Emilia. You'll remember that was made out of concrete. It was one of the earliest examples of concrete construction in the Republic in Rome. Uh, a series of barrel vaults linked to one another on three tiers, as you'll recall, with axial and lateral uh, spatial relations inside uh, that structure. Uh, Ostia needed its own warehouses as well. It had them in the Republic already, uh, but it began to add to them in the second century AD. And it's fascinating to see what happens when you build a warehouse out of concrete faced with brick. You get an extraordinary structure that looks very much like an insula. I mean, if I had put this up and said, what is this, and you said it's an insula, uh, you would, you know, you would, you would be sort of be on the mark because it looks exactly like an insula. Uh, but it is a warehouse. And this is the most fa famous warehouse in Ostia, the so-called Orea, because the word Orea, H-O-R-R-E-A, is warehouse in Latin. The Orea Epigothiana, which you have on your monument list, which dates to 145 to 150 AD. This is the entrance to the Orea Epigothiana. Uh, it is, again, made out of concrete, faced with brick, exposed brickwork, brickwork enjoyed in its own right for its own aesthetic here. Uh, we can see that, that it is like the, um, like the apartment houses in that it is multi-storied uh, with the large entranceways or uh, entranceways into the structure down below and then the smaller windows up above. They have monumentalized the entrance, the main entrance to the structure by giving it a column supporting a pediment. Very grand, in fact, and, and it, we haven't, we, we, it's interesting to see that even uh, with this brick-faced concrete architecture, the Romans have not lost their interest in Hellenizing works of art and using touches of ancient Greece uh, to monumentalize and to make more more, um, you know, more, more cultured, in a sense, uh, the entranceway into this structure. So we see these columns, engaged columns, supporting a pediment above, capitals uh, on those columns, as you can see here. All of this done in concrete, faced with brick. Uh, and you can see here, this is a, an outstanding example of the way in which they have used brick uh, to their advantage. They have recognized that you can vary the color. You can have a reddish brick, you can have a yellowish brick. So here they've used red brick uh, to face the column shaft and then a yellow brick to, uh, for the capital. So there's a distinction uh, between the shaft and the capital. And they have even used the most expensive material, uh, marble, uh, for the inscription plaque uh, where they identify this building as the Aurea Epigothiana. <laughs> Uh, and then the pediment above. And you can see, if you look at the pediment decoration and if you look at the volutes of the capitals, you will see they have used a small amount of stucco uh, to enable them to, ha to create uh, the, vo the uh, spirals of the volutes, for example, and some of the more uh, delicate uh, decorative work in the pediment above. Another subtlety, a very, another nice subtlety, it just shows you the amount of effort and time and money uh, that went into this commission. Also, this very nice pilaster that is placed right next to the column, which makes a wonderful, uh, you know, wonderful uh, transition from the column, the roundness of the column, to the squareness of the pilaster, to the shape of the doorway. The aesthetics uh, very much on the mind of this particular designer, as well as the vistas again, this idea of looking through one space, seeing another opening, uh, and wondering where that opening is going. Uh, all of that very, very carefully designed by the architect. Here's another view head on of this elaborate doorway leading into the Aurea Epigothiana announcing with the inscription uh, exactly where you are and what this building was used for in antiquity. A detail of the pediment uh, where we can see the inscription. We can also see the capitals, the use of stucco work here, and the very elaborate 
uh, work that they have done to decorate the pediment above. Uh, just a few more details of the columns where you can see even better uh, this capital and the way in which they have used brick. They have used brick for the, even for the acanthus leaves, you can see that there are acanthus leaves here. This is actually an example, one of the few we've seen of the composite capital with the acanthus leaves of the Corinthian and the volutes of the Ionic. We saw it on the Arch of Titus in Rome. Uh, but here we see that they've used brick and then only at the uppermost part where the leaf has to curve over uh, do they add the stucco. So um, tremendous, and this is just a warehouse and yet a tremendous amount of effort has gone uh, into making it an extraordinarily beautiful building and it shows again that they are absolutely going over the top uh, in terms of their, of, of being enamored of what they can do with brick facing that they are now able to expose. Once they can expose it, they're much more willing to put the effort into it. Uh, uh, to make it really attractive. And if you go into the courtyard of the Orea Epigothiana, and by the way, behind, within these uh, areas here, we have uh, annular vaulting, uh, you can see these niches that have been placed here. I mean, they don't really need these niches in this courtyard of this warehouse. Uh, what do they use these niches for? Well, perhaps they put uh, little statuettes of, of, of gods uh, that, the, that those who worked here favored and protected their, their, daily, uh, their daily toil uh, here in the Orea Epigothiana. But look at the attention that they've paid uh, to these niches. Uh, that have no other purpose than to be attractive and possibly again to hold these statuettes. Uh, but you can see here again with this combination of stucco work for the pilasters and the capitals uh, and brickwork, brickwork creating these interestingly shaped lozenges and triangles uh, to create, uh, it shows an interest again in geometric form and the contrast of one geometric form to another just as we saw in black and white mosaic. Uh, capitalized on by uh, these designers. Now I don't want to leave you with the impression uh, that because brick uh, is now exposed uh, for in, in, and enjoyed in its own right, uh, that there are no walls that were stuccoed and painted in Ostia. That would be a mis, uh, misconception because there are still painted walls in Ostia. On the insides of some of these buildings, they still opted to stucco over the wall and to paint it. And I want to show you just one glorious example, the insula of the painted vaults, uh, which dates to 150 to 200, uh, is one that has one of our best preserved ceilings, walls and ceilings anywhere uh, in a Roman house. Uh, you can see how well preserved it is here and it is what we call the spoked wheel effect uh, because what the ceiling decoration does look like a spoked wheel. Uh, we can also see this division, in fact as you look at it I, th I think you'll be as struck as I am by the fact that as we look at this spoke spoked wheel we really get the sense uh, that we're looking at one of Hadrian's pumpkin domes in paint because you can see uh, the segmented dome effect here. Uh, and, and also the octagonal, in a sense, the octagonal effect that one also gets from this structure, as well as the, the, the effect of the ribs of a groin vault, uh, as you can see well here. But it's a painted version of a pumpkin dome, and it's not surprising uh, to see that Hadrian's uh, pumpkin domes took off in this way. I also just want to mention to you that while there is a fair amount of post, what we call post Pompeian painting, Roman painting after AD 79, Almost all of it is uh, an exploitation of the fourth style of Roman painting as we know it from Pompeii. There's actually not as much invention as one would expect uh, after 79 in Roman painting. I want to show you very briefly the uh, Insula of the Muses, the Insula of the Muses in Ostia, which dates to around AD 130. Uh, because this is one of the few uh, single family dwellings that we see in the second century in Ostia. Uh, you can see if you look at the plan that it is arranged not around an atrium but around a peristyle court here, although there aren't the columns, there are these, uh, these uh, piers as you can see also in plan. <coughs> but just as we saw in the late Roman house, the late House, the late first century A.D. houses in Herculaneum from between the, <coughs> the, <coughs> the, uh, the uh, earthquake and the eruption of Vesuvius, uh, the triclinium has become the most important room in the house. You enter into it here, uh, you have a vestibule, you have this court, and then you have on axis the triclinium of the house. But what makes this particular house most distinctive is the fact that every single, every single floor 
uh, is covered with mosaic. So as I said to you before, uh, the black and white mosaic reigns supreme in the city of Ostia, and it's clear that everyone who could afford it uh, decorated their, every room of their house with mosaic. And uh, although this doesn't come from this particular house, this comes from the house of Apuleius in Ostia, it's not on your monument list, you don't have to remember it, but I just wanted to show it to you uh, because it's a marvelous example of what can be done. I wish it were a little more in focus, but it's a marvelous example of what could be done and was done using black and white mosaic in Ostia, only black and white tesserae with a, a, a Medusa head in the center. And then if you, this is one of these examples, uh, illusionistic examples, and as you look at it and focus on it, it's hard to tell exactly what's, you know, what's in the foreground, what's in the background. It's got that a kind of op art effect that those of you who know uh, our op art of the 1960s, and I, and I show you an example of it, a, uh, a, a painting from the Blaze series by the op artist Bridget Riley of the 1960s. I've, I've mentioned so many times in the course of this semester that there isn't the, anything that the Romans didn't do uh, before anybody else, and this is, uh, an, an op art is an example of that. So we do see op art in Ostia, uh, and um, we see it obviously also much later in, con in more contemporary painting. Another bath structure in Ostia, this one, the Baths of the Seven uh, Wise Men or the Seven Sages, dates to A.D. 130. I show it to you only to show you this one circular room and not because it's a bath building but rather because it has a wonderful mosaic on the floor. Again, a circular structure with a circular mosaic, once again done in black and white. And if you look at this, you can see that what we have represented here, I'll show you a detail in a moment, is a flowering acanthus plant that has intertwined within its leaves hunters and the hunted, hunted animals and their hunters uh, in combat, as you can see here. Uh, and here's a detail where you can see, once again, done entirely in black and white mosaic, the hunters, the animals, uh, very carefully depicted, interspersed among these, uh, these uh, flowering acanthus plants, very effectively done. This is another view of the Baths of Neptune uh, in uh, Ostia, which we looked at before, dates to 139 A.D. And this is a good view because it shows you not only the uh, a brick face concrete construction of these structures, but also uh, the mosaics themselves uh, and how every single room of this bath was covered with black and white mosaic. The pièce de résistance, the finest mosaic in the complex, is this one, and it's the one from which the bath gets its name, the Baths of Neptune, because we see Neptune himself in the center of the scene. It's not surprising that the, uh, that the god of the sea was chosen uh, as an appropriate subject for a bath building. We see him here with his trident, that's how we know it's him, uh, being, uh, being uh, carried along by four horses. He's holding the reins of those horses. His mantle is billowing up behind him. One expects to see a chariot here. One thinks of this as Neptune in a chariot, but it's not Neptune in a chariot. Uh, you can see that these horses, by the way, aren't fully horses, but are the front part is a horse and the rest is a sea creature. And you can see that the legs of uh, of Neptune are, inter are interwoven uh, with, the, with the tail of the sea creature. He's, in fact, using uh, the tails of those sea creatures almost like, um, uh, you know, almost like skates or uh, as, he, as he makes his way along uh, this, or water skis, I guess is a better way of putting it, water skis as he makes his way from right to left uh, across the white background. Uh, one of the interesting things about this mosaic is you see the tension uh, in the in the minds and 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 uh, you know and, and work of of this of this artist uh, in in on one hand uh, making these very abstract black shapes against a white background, but at the same time paying a lot of attention to the actual musculature to what the chest of the god uh, uh, Poseidon would have looked like as you look at it. There, there's you know, very pronounced musculature that's carefully uh, done here by the artist. Here are our friends, the dolphins, frolicking, uh, dolphins with cupids on their back, uh, some fairly uh, other floating figures, a female figure on the back of another sea creature, uh, all of this going on on the floor of the Baths of Neptune. But what's particularly interesting, I think, is the same sort of thing in, that we saw in the Piazzale Daily Corporazioni. And that is that the artist has designed this in such a way that it doesn't matter which part of the room you're standing in. Wherever you are standing, you can look onto the floor from where you are standing and see at least some of the figures head on, whether you're standing here, 
whether you're standing here, whether you're standing up there, or to the right, you are always seeing some, not all, but some of the figures head on. So again, this is, not, this is done with great care uh, and orchestrated to fit the space in which it was located. Here a detail of the uh, mosaic that we just looked at showing Neptune uh, and his horses and sea creatures. The most important development that happens at Ostia uh, uh, with regard to residential architecture later in its history is we do begin to see the reemergence of the domus already in the second century and then uh, even more so in the third and fourth centuries AD. And I want to show you quickly uh, two examples of that because they tell us a good deal about late uh, residential architecture in Ostia and also by association in Rome. This is the Domus of Fortuna on Anaria, uh, an axonometric view of that house. It dates to the late second century AD but was remodeled significantly in the fourth century AD and I think we really need to think of it as more a fourth century house than as a, um, as a second century house. And by the way, Pom uh, Ostia was still thriving in the third century. By the 400, by the year 400 AD, it was abandoned. But in the third century, still a thriving, and early fourth century, still a thriving city. Uh, we see this house here. It's a, an axonometric view from Ward Perkins. The most important features, besides the fact that it's a single story dwelling, single family dwelling, is the fact that it has an open court here with a pool, uh, that it has a, the triclinium as the most important room of the house, so that continues on in residential architecture. But there's a particular taste for apses in these late Roman buildings. You can see that this one has an apse, uh, not so unlike the apse that we saw in Domitian's Palatine Palace on the Palatine Hill. It is finally uh, starting to catch on, among others. Uh, we see that you go into that, uh, that uh, that room through uh, and three arches on columns uh, and this idea of supporting a triple arch on columns is also a very popular motif in domestic architecture in later antiquity. And look also at the fact that on the left hand side of the triclinium there is a fountain. So the incorporation of a fountain, a, fountain co a, a pool court here, uh, a fountain there, uh, an apsed triclinium and then views through uh, tri a triple arches supported by columns, all characteristic features of late Roman domestic architecture. This is a view obviously through the columns supporting that triple arch toward the uh, fountain on the left and toward the apse uh, in the center of the structure uh, and you can see the remains of marble revetment, real marble revetment uh, that was used both on the floor for the pavement and also on the walls. The other house I want to show you briefly is the Domus of Cupid and Psyche, the more famous of the two. This dates without any question to late antiquity to around A.D. 300. Uh, the house of Cupid and Psyche, we see it first in plan uh, and you can see it's very simple. An entranceway here, a long corridor, a series of cubicula on, either, on one side of that corridor. Uh, there may have been a second story on a small part of the house, you can see the stairway there. Uh, as you walk along the corridor, you eventually end up in the very large triclinium. So again, from the time of the house of the Mosaic Atrium and Herculaneum to here, uh, the triclinium uh, gaining in importance. As you walk along that corridor, you look through a series of columns supporting arches, as we'll see, customary of buildings of this time, and then look at this wall, which is scalloped uh, for a fountain. So another one of these fountain courts that seems to be popular during this period. Here's a view into the room with the lovers, uh, the famous statue uh, of Cupid and Psyche, uh, the young Cupid, the little, little young Cupids and Psy Cupid and Psyche uh, uh, embracing one another. <coughs> That's uh, from that statue that the house gets its name. One of the best preserved marble revetted rooms in the history, in the, in the history of Roman architecture uh, is this room here. The, probably the triclinium in the house of Cupid and Psyche. Uh, you can see that even marble from the walls is preserved as well as on the pavement and on the steps and on uh, the side, the base of the walls as well. Brick-faced concrete construction, 
faced with real marble. What makes this particular house especially appealing, besides that wonderful statue, is the fact that although there's the usual touches of maroon and green that we tend to see in many of these Roman pavements, uh, most of the color is a pastel, and it makes it look particularly attractive. Uh, and it goes particularly nicely with the red and yellow uh, of the brick construction. And I show you a detail here uh, of that marble revetment, uh, which gives you as good an idea as anything I have shown you this semester of what the original Hellenistic palaces of the kings, uh, the uh, palaces of Nero and Domitian, would have looked like in their heyday. And a detail of the statue of Cupid and Psyche and the room in which that found itself, uh, it can still be seen there today, uh, and the marble revetment, once again, done in pastel colors of the floor and of the walls, uh, giving us, again, an excellent sense, not only of fourth century domestic architecture decor, uh, but also what so many of the buildings that are no longer preserved, uh, whose revetment is no longer as well preserved as one would wish, what they would have looked like in antiquity. A view through the corridor, through the uh, columns, in this case gray granite columns that probably would have supported an arcade, uh, but then without question the fountain on the side of the wall uh, that is scalloped, uh, both down here and the wall itself, and then the columns there do support arches. So this whole concept of columns supporting arches, very much a part of late Roman house design. Uh, in the very few minutes that remain, I just want to say a few words about, uh, we talked about the life of this port city. I want to talk about, since I said the lecture was about life and death, I want to just end with saying a few words about the tombs in which the people who lived here were buried. Uh, people all up and down the social pyramid uh, lived in uh, this commercial center. The simplest tombs, and, and by the way, I mentioned to you already that there are tombs both outside the city of Pompeii on the major roads and then a little bit further away at this place called Isola Sacra or the Sacred Island uh, where one can see particularly well-preserved tombs uh, from those who lived in Asti of the second century. Those who, the, the working poor, uh, were buried in very simple tombs of two types. The upper part of clay amphoras, just the upper part, they were broken, and then the upper part was, stu was stuck into the ground. The remains of the person were placed below the ground, uh, and then the spout could be used to pour wine libations into. Uh, the other simple type was tiles that were, the body was placed below, and then tiles were arranged around it looking almost like a, uh, a, a kind of a house uh, that helped to protect this idea of the houses of the living and the houses of the dead that were meant to uh, protect the body. But most of the tombs are of what we call the house type. We looked at the house type on the Via Appia in the age of Augustus in Rome, uh, a tomb that resembles a house from the front with a doorway and a couple of windows and then an inscription plaque and note the use of the travertine jams uh, and lintel around it, just as we saw in the markets of Trajan in Rome. But if you look at these in this very good view from the side, you will see that almost all of these are barrel vaulted tombs, which is characteristic of second century tomb architecture at Ostia, at Isola Sacra, these barrel vaulted structures with uh, facades that make them look like houses. Uh, here's a detail of one of them, one of these house tombs, uh, with again the uh, travertine jams down below, uh, with the touch of a pediment up above. They haven't lost their interest in Hellenization to a certain extent. Windows here, slit windows here, an inscription, a long inscription plaque that tells us who was buried there. And then very often in these wonderful tombs for this commercial center, these panels that are done in terracotta that tell us something about the profession of those who were buried here. Here's probably a shipper uh, was buried here, someone who made his money in the import and export business. And over here, you can maybe barely make out a representation of a mill, just as those that we would have saw in, saw in Pompeii, or we saw in the tomb of the baker Eurysikis, a mill with a, uh, a worker and uh, a mule that is helping to rotate uh, the mill of the bakery. So perhaps a baker also from this particular family. I've, in, I've superimposed a couple of other terracotta plaques, making them a little larger here, to show you that these two 
uh, belong to uh, people who made their profession by sharpening knives, <coughs> knife sharpeners. Uh, and they not only sharpened knives, and you can see them both doing this in this scene, but they also sold them. And I love the way in this still life they've arrayed every possible knife uh, that you can sharpen here or buy uh, from these individuals. And what do you think the professions were of these two? This one clearly a shop, someone selling things in a shop. Looks like vegetables once again, asparagus and maybe broccoli or some such over there. But what about this one? What was the profession of this one? Midwife, midwife, and I love this because here we have this woman about to give birth. She's got another woman uh, holding her and giving her support. And here, the midwife, uh, instead of looking at what she's doing, uh, she's reaching in, but she's not, she's, she's instead of looking at what she's supposed to be concentrating on, she's looking out uh, at the spectator just to make sure that we don't forget her features uh, for posterity on this tomb relief uh, from her tomb in Ostia. Uh, we saw columbaria, these underground columbaria with these niches uh, where they placed the cremated remains of the deceased and had inscriptions. We see the same sort of thing in the interiors of tombs at Ostia, uh, but they are, on, they are above ground rather than subterranean at Ostia. And we also see, and basically the last point I want to make today, is we also see in the interiors of these tombs at Ostia, not only those niches for the cremated remains, but it's in the second century AD, the time of Hadrian on, that inhumation, burial, becomes the norm, uh, largely on, under the influence of the spread of Christianity, the idea the, of the, 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 the soul needs to ascend to heaven, and so you have to maintain the bodily remains. And so we begin to see in these interiors what we call arcosolia, A-R-C, arco, A-R-C-O-S-O-L-I-A, arcosolia, which are these much larger niches where bodies are placed, Bodies are buried, and then they are covered over with a marble slab that might have the inscription naming the deceased or uh, a figural scene. And just in closing, to show you one last tomb that we're going to look at next time, the tomb of the Caetanii in the Vatican Cemetery in Rome, uh, to show you that these concrete brick-faced uh, tombs with windows and with very elaborate interiors also begin to be put up in Rome in the second century AD. We'll look at those. We'll look at the title of next time's lecture is Bigger is Better. We're really going to culminate our move toward la larger, more grandiose buildings then. And then on Thursday, we will finally move out to the provinces by studying uh, Roman architecture in Roman North Africa. Thank you.